to people personally, but he had very little Shall sense, I think, of what it took to be a political leader. What's that? Let's see Lindbergh. Many on the right hoped he would stick to the world of literary biography and book reviews. But I think we could have, we could have a little fun with that, don't you think yeah. so? Right, you are? I thought so. That makes a change of pace yes. for you. Yes. Yes. Okay. I think the trouble with Michael is that he really belongs to the aristocratic radicalism of the early 19th century. I mean, very like his heroes, Byron and Shelley. And he reminded me very much of Shelley, who I think is his favorite poet, because Shelley was also the son of a Whig upper-class MP who became a great thorn in the side of the establishment. But Michael, in the end, was basically a romantic with very little touch with reality. Borrow, who said, uh, beware of any enterprise that requires new clothes, and often I think of that when I have to set off for the House of Commons. And downstairs we have the great Italians and the great Venetians, although up here, Rossini, who uh, usually governs the place on a Sunday night when we play uh, him, because Rossini was the hero also of Hazlitt and of Stondahl and of Heine and of many of the others who are in this room. But for all his love of books and music, Michael Foote, encouraged by his wife, was not lacking in worldly ambition. When the crown was within his grasp, he didn't spurn it. I reacted to Michael's candidature at first with disbelief. Someday someone will write a learned work on the influence of politicians' wives on the bad decisions that politicians make. And I think Jill Foote was responsible in very large part for Michael's candidature. He came in at the last minute, I think. He had made a lot of speeches supporting Peter Shaw, and we assumed that he would be a great tribune for Peter Shaw. His candidature was clearly a hideous mistake from the party's point of view, and in my view, a mistake from his point of view as well. Dennis Healy's campaign was curiously low-key and his manner aloof. When he was asked to write an article for The Guardian, to the amazement of his right-wing supporters, he refused. His rivals, by contrast, were happy to oblige. We saw Michael Foote, we saw Peter Shaw, both of whom were charming and interesting, uh, and we saw Dennis Healy. And Dennis Healy, if you like, was our natural leader. He didn't seem to be all that keen to fight the battle on Europe. He didn't seem to be very keen to fight the battle on the economy, which is very strange. He certainly didn't seem to want to take a very tough line against the constitutional changes. And when some of us protested a little about this and said, for goodness sake, you know, you must feel strongly about some of these things and want to do something about them, he said something like, um, well, what you have to remember is what matters in this election is the middle ground in the PLP. You don't matter at all. After all, you've got nowhere else to go. It was, an, it was a classic answer from a tough, somewhat cynical politician, but it was too cynical for its own good, and I think that was part of the trouble, that Dennis didn't realise how powerfully and passionately some of us uh, online, the moderates, really felt by this time. How do you think the vote will go? On the day of the final ballot, well. it was clear that Dennis Healy's close? attempt to woo the left had failed. Are you confident of winning? I could wait to see what happens. Why are you being so reticent? Why, why wouldn't you say uh, how you feel? Because I think it's stupid to speculate when we shall know the facts in an hour or two. Despite keeping a low profile during the campaign, his right-wing views were well known. Given the mood of the times and the personal animosity he aroused, his campaign was a non-starter. The basic thing was there were a lot of middle-of-the-road backbench MPs who wanted a quiet life and thought I would stir things up. And, of course, the last thing they got was a quiet life. They had the most disturbed period, and, of course, a lot of them lost their seats in consequence of their stupidity. But still, that's life too. There were many of us who thought that Dennis Healy, again, for all his uh, immensely um, powerful virtues as a, as a parliamentary fighter uh, and as, a, as a, a great force within the party, nevertheless not a conciliator and someone who would split the party, whereas Michael Foote would be much more likely to be a conciliator who would bring the party together, who would heal the wounds. And I think that was a very widespread belief. On the 10th of November, 1980, Michael Foote, the left winger, beat Dennis Healy by 10 votes. In a gesture of unity, he immediately announced that Healy would be his deputy. 
think that the Labour Party's got a history of making great mistakes, which I trust are now over. But it was a very, very serious mistake. When I left the committee room, at which Michael Foote's election was declared as leader of the Labour Party, I said to the two people I went out with, who were John Gilbert and Anne Taylor, the Labour Party has just voted to lose the next general election. I was convinced of that. And that was not because I had anything against Michael Foote personally. In the years of painful failure that followed, many of Dennis Healy's colleagues were to rue the day they rejected him. For Healy himself, his defeat in the leadership was more than a personal tragedy. I regret not working harder in the leadership campaign because I think if I'd worked harder for, for the leadership, I could have saved the country at least four years, maybe eight years of uh, Thatcherism. So I, I do feel, in a way, I let the movement down by not working harder, but whether I would have done better if I'd worked harder is a very open question. It's been said that, uh, that your election is the best news for Mrs. Thatcher. What do you say to that? Who could be such a fool as to say such a thing as that? Do Don't say they printed that in your newspaper. I trust not. Under Michael Foote's leadership, the Labour Party would give its full backing to unilateral nuclear disarmament, withdrawal from the European community, and a massive programme of public spending. The great thing you have to understand about the election of Michael Foote was that it was a conscious decision by the parliamentary Labour Party to abdicate, not to worry about the next election, not to worry about its popularity in the country, but to behave in a way which gave beleaguered members of Parliament the best chance of coming to an accommodation with their constituency parties. In a sense, what he did with the party was for those people far less important than their ability to go back to the little Thumpington constituent Labour Party and say, I'm a left winger, I voted for Michael Foote, reselect me because I'm the sort of man you want. But for one man, Neil Kinnock, the election of Michael Foote his friend and patron, boded well. I was delighted by it, but I did say to a lot of colleagues on the left then, we have uh, the first left-wing leader of the Labour Party ever. We now have got to do everything possible to support him. Everybody nodded their heads. Uh, some did support him, others didn't. Three days after taking over as leader of the Labour Party, Michael Foote broke his ankle. It seemed an ominous portent. Many MPs had voted for Foote as the man most likely to prevent a split in the party. His impact proved to be the reverse. This is ITN, Mr Foote. Ah, ITN. Will you report that? Well, if you watch no news at No engagement ten. is cancelled, including the removal of the government. Is it going to slow it up in any way? No, no, no. We'll probably bring it forward a bit, you know. <laughs> what? No one realized at the time, I certainly didn't, and I'm sure other people throughout the party didn't realize that the party was going to split apart quite so dramatically uh, and so persistently and so disastrously uh, in the way it did. Uh, I certainly didn't realize that within two years of uh, supporting Michael Foote, we were going to have a page in every national newspaper, if not more than one page, every single day, recounting the divisions of the Labour Party in the last 24 hours. But right-wing MPs, horrified by the election of Michael Foote, were already meeting in secret to plot their departure from the Labour Party. This is private, this is Sunday, you all ought to be home with your family. It's intense it's intense 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 rain. We're not going to say anything either now or later. Just down to the door, so okay, sure chair. Right, sir. Will you be in fact discussing a new political party today? I can't say anything. I've got no statement to make. There were a lot of meetings in Shirley Williams's flat, but I, I think by that time, quite a lot of the... How many MPs came at first? I think there were 11 in all, 11, 12. There were, I think by that time, um, at least half of them were at least as keen to go um, as, uh, as, as I was. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. How long will you be here for? It's going to be a sentence. I'm sorry, time. I was talking to somebody else. What I think I can say absolutely firmly is there won't be a statement, either collective or individual, and I haven't one to make at the moment. I think they were influenced by the impossibility, from the point of view of our most fundamental beliefs, of advocating what the Labour Party was coming to stand for. I, I don't know. You've got, you've I had got tremendous about. arguments with some of my friends who wanted to create an independent party, the SDP, telling them, for heaven's sake, hang on and don't 
weaken people whose views you mainly share in the Labour Party by going off on this uh, useless uh, adventure. Uh, but they disagreed with